And uh, this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek uh, tongue title. Camp Cloud Wi-Fi is not ready for the large enterprise cam uh, campus, which is one of the challenges that most cloud Wi-Fi providers get you know, stuck into this. You're, you're just for distributed, you're just for SMB, that sort of thing. Uh, we certainly feel that our architecture uh, allows us to scale to uh, large enterprise campuses and figured I would take uh, each little objection and kind of poke holes in it, right? So, um, you know, you always talk to various network managers and, you know, the cloud architecture has been around since 2003, 2004. Um, and in some ways, it's kind of a crutch because it's like, oh, well, if I don't have a cloud, I can't do X, Y, Z. Uh, how do I proceed with, you know, doing my troubleshooting or pulling data out of that central point, et cetera? Um, but we've kind of... Um, uh, taken each point and made sure that we have the equivalent function in a cloud architecture. So one of the one of the reasons controllers took over the world, right? Um, not just how many APs can I manage with one manageable network element, and right? if I can aggregate, you know, 512 APs onto a controller platform, then that's only one point that I'm managing, not 512. But the thing that made it so easy was I can tunnel my VLANs into the core. I don't have to deal with trunking my VLANs out to every access point. Um, and as well, you might just think, well, my network is way too, way too large for the cloud vendors. So one unique thing to talk about is our architecture. And um, when the autonomous AP came around, right, if it's a, it, it does a control plane, it does management plane, you have passwords on there, pre-shared keys, radius shared secrets, anything you want is on this one device. And as I scale that device to thousands of, of, of units, um, I then need a management platform to take care of that, right? So that's where controllers came in. But when controllers came in, the other notable thing was they took different functions within the access point, sliced it in half, and said, okay, controller, you're doing these functions. Access point, you're doing these functions. And that varied between vendors. Some vendors were very lightweight on the access point, did everything in the controller. Other vendors did more in the access point, less in the controller, and so on. We actually sliced this into three. So we have our management plane lives completely in the cloud. That's your configuration, that's your reporting, that's your monitoring, as you saw. Uh, our control plane is distributed amongst the access points. This is uh, RRM. This is uh, you know, um, um, uh, PMK caching, that sort of thing, client maintenance, all that. Um, and then our data plane is flexible. And this is one of the key pieces with regards to scaling to, to enterprises, is uh, if, I'm, if I have a distributed control plane, um, Number one, my access points aren't creating a virtual controller, right? So some vendors will use a group of APs, create a virtual controller, and then that has a, mass, uh, a max scaling from the number of APs supported, more importantly, from the number of clients that can be part of that virtual controller fabric. We don't have that because that control plane is distributed. Uh, from a data plane flexibility um, point is we can... Uh, local bridge traffic, just like any other, you know, cloud-based uh, access point or even some standalone access points. But we can also tunnel this to a central location. And this is really where most large campuses, you start getting into universities where there's three, five, seven thousand APs within one geographic area. Ninety percent of the time or more, those, uh, those networks are tunneled to a central data center for multiple reasons. Uh, first reason is just it's easy to deploy a large network fast that way because I don't have to worry about the wired ports of the APs. But one thing in the past two or three years that have become more and more common are large scale subnets, um, slash 16, slash 18. So, I mean, a um, lot of campuses around here, you know, slash 18 for all of their employees and all of their buildings, right? So how can I do this if I have 30,000 devices on a slash 18, slash 16, I can't push that down to a, you know, a $1,200 edge switch. It's just the cam table is not large enough. So you need to bring that traffic into the core where you have routing hardware that is capable of that, that level of scale. That's where, this multi, that's where this tunneling to the multi-service platform takes place. Also gives you other ancillary benefits, tunneling, to the guest, tunneling your guest network to a DMZ. Uh, these are all things that enterprises do in large campuses. And it's just part of you have to play in that sandbox in order to be successful in that market. And we give you the options to do whatever. And this is on a per SSID basis. So I could tunnel one SSID, I could local bridge another SSID, et cetera, et cetera. What's the tunnel tunneling technology there? Uh, GRE, it's layer two GRE in that case. And we're going to be adding um, uh, IPsec later this year. So it's okay. on, on encrypted tunneling right now? That one is, yes. 
Okay. Yeah, but this is assuming on campus within your own trusted right. network. Yeah. But we could conceptually tunnel it to any GRE capable device? You could, yeah. One of the reasons for the multi-service platform, which is an x86 box, is that you know in most enterprises, say I have 2,500 APs, and then I have a tunnel per AP, I don't want to get in the habit of yeah. configuring the other end of that tunnel 2,500 times, right? Yeah. So this, this gives you that. But if, you're, if you want to terminate it to a third-party device, and some of our telco customers certainly do, yeah, it certainly supports that. See, the other thing is not only that, but what about roaming? I, I, I talk to a lot of people, and they get hung up on the fact that controllers are the end-all, be-all when it comes to roaming, right? Um, from a layer three perspective, that can be an anchor for, for layer three roaming. We've actually elected not to support layer three roaming for a few reasons, which I'll get into. Um, so, you know, we really deal with layer two roaming. Um, layer two roaming means that uh, the extent of my roaming is really the four-way handshake between APs. Therefore, all the APs have the PMK uh, for that particular client. We use uh, an inner AP communication protocol between the access points on a layer two domain where they share certain states. Uh, PMK ID, the authentication state of the client, the IGMP state of the client. This means that the, the neighboring APs already have the PMK, so thus they can do a WPA2 four-way handshake. Um, they also uh, share uh, RF information, neighbors, that sort of thing. But when you start getting into very large scale, so your L2 network becomes you know, very large, right? I don't want every access point in my network to have to cache PMKs for every single client. So you have like work. a RF neighbor grouping? Yeah. Oh. So that's what this is. So we have, uh, we developed a, a technology called, we call Mojo Smart Exchange. And it effectively means that here's my client, my PMK on that AP. That AP is going to share it with its RF neighbors. And so therefore when I roam, I think I'm going to roam to AP7, then that PMK is now shared with its RF neighbors. And so basically the, the system is attempting to sh basically stay one step ahead of the client no matter where they'll roam. But the end result of this feature is really that um, it, it scales down how many APs have to know which PM, you know, for which client and uh, you know, kind of have to repeat the PMK for every single time. So in our large campus deployments uh, where there's hundreds or maybe even thousands of APs in the same L2 do domain, this becomes very important. Um, yeah. So one other possible objection. I cannot integrate your management system into my existing tools. Your management system lives in the cloud. All my tools live on my local network. You know, they can't really talk to each other uh, because your cloud does not have a connection to my private network and I'm not going to open a hole for your system to come talk to my system, right? Um, that was an interesting, interesting piece because most, every, most large enterprises have certain, it's, it's, it's less important to, dis, to detail, detail the, uh, the actual technology they use. It's more the process. You know, they have very strict processes. When, when I open a ticket, this has to happen, you know, that sort of thing. So they have um, standards, that sort, of, that sort of thing. So if I come in with a new network product, I have to interoperate with those existing standards. I don't want to have to tell them, oh, I'm sorry, you can't do it this way because we don't support something that you require to get that information, right? That's typically SNMPs, like NMS systems, syslog systems, SEIMs, those sort of things. So I want to be able to integrate with that very easily without them having to change their process. So therefore, we actually have a specialized mode where one of our APs can be turned into what we're calling a cloud integration point. This has been in production for six months or so. Um, where this lives on your network and creates a effectively a VPN tunnel to the cloud, but it becomes a, a proxy of sorts where uh, information from the management system through the cloud integration point can then be sent into syslog, can be sent into the security incident management system, that sort of thing. As well, um, uh, you know, we could do SNMP traps and any kind of outbound uh, sort of conversation that we need to send that the, that the cloud has to figure out and then send information into your existing systems. So this was an important piece to, to square away. What about redundancy? Hear this a lot because if you've been doing controllers for the past 12 years, what's on top of your mind when you're in a large campus deployment? You're thinking, oh, you know, I need failover, I need all these other things. Inherently, since we have a distributed control plane, we have inherent redundancy because each AP is up of its own volition and is not depending on some other system to be up 
at the same time, right? Meaning that from a from an AP to a controller relationship, if that controller goes down, your APs go down. Or I have to you know do code upgrade on my uh, on my controller, then I'm affecting all 512 APs that have, that are hanging off that controller. I can't get into selective upgrades because they're all tied together on that one um, that one uh, device. So in our case, this is all distributed. So I can do whatever I want. So there's no there's no centralized or there's no single point of failure. So there's no device that goes down that kills a lot of APs unless you start losing PoE switches. Um, and as well, and this has become one of those things that becomes more and more uh, attractive to certain customers. We've had some customers, we don't even make a point of saying this, they figure it out, and then they bring it to our attention that, hey, I can actually do this, which is staged upgrades. Some you know, uh, c customers with very high availability requirements, they've been very frustrated with, if I need to upgrade my controller, I affect APs in this entire area, but these eight APs over here, I really can't afford the downtime, so can I peel those off and not? Well, you can't, it's just that's not the way it works. In ours, I can selectively upgrade whichever I want. I can take specific APs, groups of APs. I can schedule uh, those upgrades. I can write a schedule that says if there's a new build available, then go schedule this at some point in time in the future, three in the morning, whatever. Um, but I can do it independently. Um, the APs and the, affected, uh, and the underlying Wi-Fi service are um, unaffected if for some reason the connectivity to the cloud goes down. That's extremely important. That gets into our separation between the management plane and the control plane. Since the control plane does not depend on the cloud, I can then still make RRM decisions. I can still enforce WIPS policy. Um, in fact, from a WIPS policy perspective, you know, rogues are still contained, data is still you know, collected, and if the cloud comes back, that stuff is just uploaded in mass so I don't have a, a, a gap in my logs, given a day or two of, you know, of, uh, of time frame that went by. What about data plane redundancy, multiple GRE tunnels? We do support multiple GRE tunnels to the multi-service platform. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. that failover is automatic yep, in the event of one coming down? Yep. Okay. It's the multi-service platform that will swing over between the two. This yeah. swings over, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So these are all, like if you think about these objections, these are all things that if I have a controller and I've been doing a controller for 12 years, 15 years, what am I thinking in my head, right? 